Howard Scott Warshaw was one of Atari's most well-known programmers. He was the developer for E.T., one of the most infamous games in history. Many consider it the worst game ever made, and it was a commercial failure for Atari. But is Warshaw to blame for it? And most importantly, is he a bad game designer? Let's take a look. What's up guys? It's Poger. I'm sure you've probably seen this before. I guess I could jump on some kind of bandwagon, say the game is bad, say they only had five weeks to make it, say it caused a video game crash, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, we're going to talk about Howard Scott Warshaw's other games and his history at Atari. So if you enjoy this video, leave a like rating. It does help out the YouTube algorithm. And if you enjoy this type of content, drop a subscription. It's such a small thing, but it actually helps me out greatly. Is this really his doing? Is he really a bad programmer? We're going to find out right now. After graduating from Tolan University, Howard Scott Warshaw had an opportunity to pursue a computer science degree with a scholarship. He took the scholarship and graduated with a master's degree in computer engineering. Fresh out of school, Warshaw began working at HP. However, he found the job boring, so he began looking for other opportunities. From there, he heard about a position for Atari, so he applied and joined the team in 1981. So just to put this timeline into perspective, some of Atari's best programmers like David Crane already left and created Activision. Warsaw's first task was to port the arcade game Star Castle to the 2600, but he quickly realized this type of game would be too difficult to make on the console, so he reworked his game and made an original title instead. This would eventually become Yar's Revenge. The name is interesting. The word Yar is just Ray spelled backwards, which is meant to be named after the CEO of Atari, Ray Kassar. So here you play a creature that's supposed to destroy the boss in the middle. Your regular bullets won't kill the boss, you need to get the cannon shot by nibbling at the red barrier. You need to align yourself in the right position in order to hit the boss, which can be challenging because this little cursor can kill you. There's a cool looking barrier in the center of the stage called the neutral zone. You're not able to shoot bullets when you're inside, but you're also immune to the cursor enemy. There's not much to the game, but it's actually pretty fun. It's very unique, and I like the controls. You can move and shoot in multiple directions, including diagonally. So there's not much content here, there's only two stages, and then it repeats. The difficulty increases every stage, so Warshaw did everything he could to improve the replayability. Overall, this is a solid title. This game ended up doing really well for Atari, becoming the best-selling original title on the 2600. By original, I mean not a game that was licensed or ported from the arcade. However, there's something very interesting that Warshaw secretly put in this game. Like other employees working for Atari, Warshaw wasn't happy that he wasn't receiving any credit for his work. So, behind Atari's back, he included a secret message that will display if you perform a very specific task within the game. The message is his initials forward and backwards. Pretty cool. Warshaw being unsatisfied with Atari is going to be important for later. In 1982, Atari struck a deal with Steven Spielberg to make a couple 2600 games that were based off of some of his movies. The first movie was Raiders of the Lost Ark, which Warsaw volunteered to make a game tie-in for. Spielberg liked Warshaw's game and asked him to develop one based off of E.T., which came out earlier that year. So while Warshaw's first two games received positive feedback, he would be dealt with a very tight deadline that only gave him five weeks to complete the game. To put that in comparison, Yar's Revenge took seven months to complete, and Raiders of the Lost Ark took six months. Atari wanted this game to come out in time for the Christmas season, so the development process had to happen much quicker than the average game. 
Warshaw envisioned a game where E.T. would roam around an overworld looking for telephone pieces so he could phone home. Spielberg was shown this game before released, but wasn't a big fan of it. He even said to Warshaw, couldn't you do something more like Pac-Man? But despite Spielberg's concerns, Warshaw was confident in his original idea, so he stuck to it. Warshaw ended up completing the game in time, and it was released on schedule. So let's check it out. So the title looks very nice. This is impressive considering Warshaw only had 5 weeks to make this, and only had 4 kilobytes of ROM space to work with. Anyway, as I mentioned before, it's an overhead perspective, and your mission is to collect all the telephone pieces so you can phone home. You have a radar on top that gives you hints on where the pieces are, which I actually think is pretty advanced for a 2600 game. If you look at the bottom of the screen, E.T. has this energy meter that constantly decreases every time you walk or fall down a hole. This is basically your time limit. The game can be challenging because not only do you have to find the telephone pieces, but you also have to avoid the FBI agent and scientist who slow down your progress. The controls are kinda bad. You can walk in all directions, including diagonally, which is nice, but it's easy to fall into holes on accident, and sometimes you fall into the same hole you're trying to get out of. I don't like that some holes are placed too close to the edge of the screen, so it's easy to fall in the holes when you change from one screen to another. When you get more comfortable with the game, you'll stop falling in the holes so much, and you get better at exiting holes without falling back in so much. So this game is commonly regarded as the worst ever made, but honestly, I think this is decent. It's not great, but you can do a lot worse on the 2600. This game is often compared to Pac-Man on the 2600, because both Todd Fry and Howard Scott Warshaw had a lot of obstacles that ended up hindering the final product. I made a whole video on Pac-Man, so I recommend checking that out. So anyway, I think the reason E.T. is regarded as bad is because Atari put all their eggs in one basket. Atari paid 20 to 25 million to secure the rights to make this game, which was unheard of at the time, and they expected this game to perform much better than it did. Despite this game being a commercial failure, Howard Scott Warshaw is still looked at positively, and perhaps if he didn't have such a big time constraint, we would be looking at a different game. Warshaw would eventually go on to make another game. This one would be completely original, not based on a movie or anything. Here you play as a robot that finds a secret rocket base in his home planet, and your mission is to destroy the rocket and defeat the boss at the end. The game is divided into three boards. The first board, your character can only move left and right, and you have to prevent the enemies from reaching the rocket. In the second board, you can move in multiple directions, and you have to clear all the purple pieces at the bottom. In the third and final board, depending on what version of the game you're playing, the mission is different. In the prototype version, you control this spaceship that's supposed to shoot the dots that are coming towards you. I don't think it's completed though, because regardless of the outcome, you still advance to the next stage. I don't understand. In the final game, you face the main boss in your regular robot form. This one I greatly prefer. One thing I really liked about this game is that if you successfully destroy the purple pieces in the second round, you can actually skip the boss and move on to the next level. I get the impression this game may not have been finished, because in the first board, even if you let the enemies complete the rocket, you still advance to the second board. Shouldn't you lose or get a game over? So the fact that there's three different boards gives this a lot of variety. For an 8 kilobyte game, this is very impressive. In the first board, I really admire the sound and graphics here. The game sounds like a pinball machine, which is very fitting for this. I also love the rows that light up when you defeat an enemy. The second board is a nice change of pace. Here you have to avoid the enemies rather than shoot them down. I like that you can move in multiple directions, and the fact that you can skip the boss as a reward gives you an incentive to complete this board. If you don't complete the second board though, you have to fight the boss on the third board. He's not too hard, he dies in only one hit, but he can catch you off guard, and I usually die at least once when I'm forced to fight him. Once you complete all the boards, you restart on the first board again, and rinse and repeat. 
So like with Yara's Revenge, Warshaw improved the replayability by making the game progressively harder, even on the repeating stages. So overall, I think Saboteur is a fantastic 2600 game, one of the best games on the console. Had this game been released, it probably would have been one of the best selling games. So what happened? Well, the atmosphere at Atari was getting bad. The company had employees that were unhappy with Atari's policies. In 1984, a new CEO came on board, and that's when the conditions at Atari got worse. Because of this, Warshaw ended up leaving the company before Saboteur was completed. After Atari lost one of their best programmers, a new contender joined the team and became one of the most important developers of the company. He released Yar's Revenge, which became one of the best-selling games on the console, but when he was offered the opportunity of a lifetime, he produced E.T., which was a commercial failure for Atari. But then he bounced back and made an excellent shooter, but due to some unfortunate circumstances, the game was never released. Warshaw's resume with Atari is pretty short, only four games, but despite that, he made a gigantic impact in the gaming industry. Hey, thanks so much for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like rating. It only takes a second and it gets my video noticed by more people. Also, if you enjoy my content, drop a subscription. That way you'll be notified when my next video comes out. Plus, it's completely free. Finally, drop a comment if you have any questions, suggestions, or just want to share your gaming experiences. This greatly helps the YouTube algorithm and I'm usually pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one guys.